Well, good morning. It's 9.30, so we should probably get started. I'm Bernie Engel, head of Ag and Biological Engineering. Great to see all of you here this morning. So before I, I do introductions, assuming we have some time at the end for questions, let me remind you now, you have uh, speakers at your desks. So if you'll press the button, continue to hold that. And so when the green light is on, you're able to speak and we'll pick that up in the recording. So, so hopefully we'll remember to remind you yet again at the end for that. So let me introduce Dean Meng Chang from, uh, from Engineering. So he will introduce our speaker. So Meng is the John A. Edwardson Dean of the College of Engineering. His research received the 2013 Alan T. Waterman Award, very prestigious award. His online courses and textbooks have reached over 250,000 people. Uh, and he's co-founded several startup companies and a nonprofit consortium. So uh, Dean Cheng. Thank you, Bernie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, uh, it is a delight to be here uh, and to introduce the outstanding lecture we have today as the third installment of the new series, the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series uh, that started uh, two months ago. And on a roughly monthly basis, uh, we have uh, uh, one distinguished lecture uh, across all engineering fields. And today, uh, we're particularly delighted with ABE, as we all know, one of the very best in the world, uh, and joint between the College of Agriculture, with uh, Dean Plout over there just joining us, uh, and uh, with uh, the College of Engineering. Uh, now, uh, I know that this is uh, being streamed and recorded, uh, and I will be tweeting it uh, momentarily. Uh, <laughs> But first of all, uh, what a, a fantastic topic and what an outstanding lecture today. Um, professor Matt Dar is the professor in agriculture and biosystem engineering and the Keynes Manufacturing Fellow at Iowa State University. He received his PhD from Ohio State and his research and teaching focus on digital agriculture broadly defined. Uh, especially in the use of electronic technology and data analytics to solve applied engineering <laughs> challenges in the agricultural industry. And he leads a large team of graduate students and staff working on precision agriculture, uh, telematics, data analytics, unmanned aerial systems, next generation machinery automation. And all of these are music to our years as here at Purdue uh, we are uh, looking at exactly this set of uh, exciting directions uh, that will transform how uh, we look at agriculture, engineering, and how we feed uh, ourselves uh, in the centuries to come. And uh, Professor Dar has received numerous awards, including the New Holland Young Researcher Award from the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers, the W. Farrell Young Educator Award from the uh, American Society of Agricultural Biological Engineers, the Supplier Innovation Award for Yield Sensor Technology uh, from Dearn Company, and the Precision Ag Excellence Award in Education Research from Precision Ag Institute. And today's topic is commercializing academic innovations in digital uh, agriculture. And I have to say, I am personally a big fan of commercializing academic innovations is a win-win. It fulfills the land-grant mission in a unique and powerful way, and it translates fundamental research into societal impact. I am eager to learn a lot today from Professor Dar's distinguished lecture. Thank Great. you for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yep. you, Matt. Can everyone in the back hear me fine? If not, there's plenty of seats up front, so you feel free to, to move down any time. Uh, it really is a pleasure to, to be here today. I've, uh, you know, the ag, the ag and biosystem engineering community is relatively small. Our discipline is relatively, uh, relatively small, and, and a lot of us already have great networks. And, and to be here for the next uh, really two days and just continue to grow the network between Iowa State and Purdue and, and collaborative opportunities is really what, uh, what has me excited to be here. Um, I will tell a quick story. Uh, you know, Purdue is, the, um, is a highly, highly ranked ag engineering program. Is that, is that correct? <laughs> is that? What are you, what's the ranking? One and two. <laughs> so I was given a, I was given a presentation. Uh, 
I gave a, I gave a presentation a, a, f a few months ago to a group of executives from John Deere, and I opened up with, Iowa State's the number one ranked engineering program, and I had an asterisk that says, you know, but we're actually tied with Purdue, and their comment was, you know, I've heard that a lot from Purdue, but they never put the asterisk on there. <laughs> and I had to tell them that, uh, you know, well, I is before P in the alphabet, so when we, we list them alphabetically, I guess we'll, we'll take that. But uh, it, it really is a pleasure to be here and talk about two things that, that personally I have a lot of passion in, both digital agriculture as well as uh, uh, commercialization. I think um, you know, Mung mentioned the importance of this uh, within the academic sector. I think there's a lot of differences depending on what disciplines you're in. And in our discipline, for us to really have a, an impact, right, to go, to go home at the end of the day and feel like we have moved the needle in agriculture, Commercialization, getting technologies to the market is something that uh, we really feel is very important to the, to the process. And, and that's different depending on the discipline you're in, but that's, uh, that's the field we come from. Uh, my intensity, I'm gonna spend a few minutes kind of introducing my program. I'm gonna talk about uh, you know, the, the breadth and scope of what digital agriculture is, provide a little bit of background. And then I'll dive a little bit more into some examples of ways we've commercialized digital agriculture, hopefully to, to use that as a way to maybe uh, inspire, open up some thoughts, and then close with some general comments around uh, uh, commercialization. Um, the folks at Purdue told me that uh, the, this is over when I'm done talking, so, uh, so just, just uh, have, have a good seat here and we'll, we'll work through this. So. Um, the, uh, the, the program I run at Iowa State, I've been at Iowa State for 10 years. I run the, uh, the Digital Ag Innovation Lab is what we call ourselves. We are a multidisciplinary team, meaning uh, within my own uh, research team, we have PhD level agronomists and soil scientists, and we have PhD level uh, computer engineering uh, staff and, and graduate students. So uh, not only are we interdisciplinary across campus, but we're also interdisciplinary within our own organization. And that is, that is key in digital agriculture. Digital agriculture, is uh, there is no such thing as a digital agriculturalist, right? It's not a, it's not a thing, it's, it's, a, it's a blend, an emerging of, uh, of technologies. Uh, we are very focused on tech transfer. That is what, uh, what drives us, what gets us going every day. Um, and at this point, almost exclusively working with industry partners. So we have uh, 15 industry partners, we do about $4 million a year in, in annual research with those partners through, uh, through our team. Um, the rest of my group, we have, uh, we have four research faculty that, uh, that work for me in, these, in, this, uh, in this area, and then a host of, of uh, professional staff that uh, help lead projects, again, most with uh, master's and PhD level backgrounds to, to lead the scientific aspect of, of what we're doing here. And the last bullet, so the global footprint has been something that's really important in the commercialization space. If we're going to uh, commercialize, uh, you know, I, I always remind our students and our, most of our students and our undergraduate programs are from the Midwest, right? Uh, from most of the, you know, in, in a relatively central area, but agriculture is global. And if we're going to think about making an impact, we have to make an impact outside of the states we serve, but also to the global breadth of what exists in, uh, in agriculture today. Why we do what we do. Um, so I, I have a lot of staff. I, do, I spend a lot of time on employee development, and I think that's a key aspect of what makes our team successful. And I ask this question to my staff every single year when they do their self-evaluations of performance. Why we do what we do. What is, what is it that really gets us up in the morning, gets us out of bed, gets us focused on being innovative and drive technology? And for us, that mission is all about advancing agriculture through the innovative use of, of technology. Agriculture is a, is a very complex industry. Uh, the decisions that have to, have to be made to execute agriculture, the risks that are involved in agriculture are very dynamic. And the use of technology has an opportunity to de-risk and enhance productivity, profitability, sustainability of agriculture in a way that we think is really powerful. And uh, that's, that's why we get up every day, that's why we, uh, that's why we come to work. The, the model that we've set up, I think is, uh, at Iowa State it's relatively unique, but I think uh, Purdue is also a real leader in, in the area of engaging with industry and thinking about how industry partnerships can really be uh, fruitful and, and lead to uh, strong partnerships that branch beyond just traditional uh, aspects of, uh, of funding. So for us, industry partnerships are really at the heart of everything we do. And through strong partnerships and the right kinds of partnerships, we can create relationships that branch from basic research to maybe applied research and all the way through the commercialization phase. Um, we believe the benefits of being able to be involved in all aspects of that allows us to better prepare our students to enter into industry and gives us a better microphone or a forum to uh, 
to have an impact, right? I relate this quite a bit to some of the colleagues I have in, in agronomy at Iowa State. And uh, um, I see at least one agronomist in the room. Is there any, anybody else from agronomy? Bruce, you're holding up the flag. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I envy the, the voice that our uh, extension agronomists have to direct change and inflect change and help to progress agriculture in the right way. And uh, for engineering, you know, if we have an innovation, Iowa State's not going to manufacture it. Purdue's not going to set up a manufacturing center and start selling products. So that partnership with, with industry is our microphone. It's how we make sure that we get the success and the innovation and the ideas out uh, to a place where they can actually impact uh, producers on the, on the farm. Um, our research team members do become integrated parts of product teams. And so uh, I think when you hit a level of, of engagement with a company, uh, there's, a, there's a certain inflection point where rather than being an outside entity that you're doing some, some research on, pretty soon you're part of the core team. Okay? From a graduate student development perspective, that is a huge opportunity. Right? Has anybody had graduate students that uh, maybe didn't always take the advice you gave them or you gave them tips on a presentation and that, I see some people smiling at least, right? Well, when they're engaged with industry all the way through their process, that's, that's, that, that gives us the ability to grow their skills professionally from a technical side as well as from a project management and overall refinement of their professional development. And, and that's what it's about, right? I mean, that's, that's why we're that's why we're here to make the uh, you know to, to to add value to those individuals along the way. The last piece, and I'm really proud that uh, you know Purdue is is very uh, innovative about this as well. But in today's day and age, at a at a uh, tier one university, in my opinion, you have to have flexibility in how you manage IP if you want to be competitive with other tier one institutions. And uh, you know there's several of us now. There's a there's a sort of a core group of 12 that have kind of led this effort. Purdue and Iowa State are both in that group that has created flexible models for industry. So when they come to work with the universities, they understand there's a pathway for them to, uh, uh, to eventually get to a commercialization phase. And we've really leveraged that uh, uh, pretty, pretty intently. OK, so what is digital agriculture? This is, the, this is going to be the audience interactive part of, of today. <laughs> How do you define digital agriculture? Of all these faculty, we always complain when students don't talk and engage, right? And Square wheel science. Well, it's new activity, physical, biological. You end up with data that is factual, so that you can optimize. So using data to try to optimize the system, right? Absolutely. What else? Robotics. Robotics and automation. Right, that's a key element, right? Is agriculture is not getting more, not getting simpler over time, right? Automation plays a key role. What else? Sensing, sensing, sensing things we couldn't sense before, potentially using uh, uh, high-resolution aerial imagery to detect things we've never seen before in agriculture. These are all parts of it, right? Is this a new field? Is digital agriculture something that's brand new? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah, I, I like that answer, right? In, uh, in my mind, um, this is where I start, and this is plant-based digital agriculture, so animal-based is a whole different thing, but I think uh, you hate to draw lines and things, but to me, we can start to draw lines around, there is a, a major emphasis for digital agriculture in genetics development. Phenomics, genetics, plant breeding, there's a, there's a ton of opportunities there to apply uh, digital agriculture. There is also a ton of opportunities in decision support. How do we make better decisions through the course of a growing season and, and, and lead to, to be, uh, better overall productivity? And there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in, uh, in autonomy. Now, the term digital agriculture has been around since 2014, right? Were we, ble were we doing plant breeding prior to 2014? <laughs> I think so, right? So are these new? Are these new areas? No, absolutely not, right? So what's happened is, in, uh, um, in digital agriculture, we have really taken data science and applied data science, innovations in machine learning and, and, uh, and computing power into these disciplines that have been around for a long time, right? 
And so when I hear somebody talk about, like, I want, I want an industry in digital agriculture, I say, well, again, I don't think there actually is a digital agriculturalist. I don't think that's necessarily a job, right? I think the career opportunities and the real innovation here is around how do we take the fundamentals of data science, the fundamentals of, of uh, again, uh, computing technology we have today, and leverage that into these existing fields to get more out of them, right? Taking data, adding value, improving decision making, and, uh, and driving forward. So I do have several examples, though, in terms of what it means today, right? So digital agriculture is information technology con uh, connecting all aspects of, uh, of production systems. So in, uh, in ag, one of the great examples is applying uh, factory automation or lean manufacturing to a lot of our systems. It takes multiple steps in a process to produce a uh, crop of corn, right? And there are, in lean manufacturing, what do we do, right? We measure, we, de we define waste, and we drive it out of the system. It's all about efficiencies, right? And that's empowered through data. So if you walk through a factory today, there are computer screens next to every robot showing throughput and, and downtime and uptime and, and uh, risks and prognostics. And the live data streams that we can now tap into in agriculture allow us to start to apply this in, uh, in our areas. So, you know, simply stated, these data streams are making us smarter and more data driven. Okay? Is agriculture always data driven? You know, if you, if you think about our growth and pro progression of agriculture, uh, certainly it is, right? But there's, there's an there's a underlying, production agriculture is always an underlying sort of a lag function there that, uh, uh, generally speaking, takes, takes a while for new technologies to be adopted, and uh, digital agriculture plays a, plays a role in that. What else is it? Uh, integrating biological engineering systems through data science. I think this is, is right in the wheelhouse of university expertises, right? Real time, things like real time uh, uh, crop growth modeling and linking those with hydrology and, and, uh, and nitrogen cycles to be able to provide information on risk for crop production management, right? This is an inherently interdisciplinary field. Where do you find experts that, that like to work together interdisciplinarily? Universities. It's a great place to us to, uh, uh, to, uh, to merge, merge strengths. Uh, digital Ag is creating instantaneous and actionable information. This is these are really key terms, and this is, in my opinion, this is really driven by the sort of user experience and the use of mobile technologies to get information into people's hands. Most of the data, much of the data that we use in digital ag is not necessarily new, okay? Bruce, when did you write the textbook on precision ag? 2000. 2000, 18 years ago, right? This is, a lot of these things have been out here, right? But, but the ability for us to move information get it into decision makers hands apply analytics to that to give some directional indication that's new right that's technology that hasn't been here forever right in fact when you look at surveys today of, of growers and say where do you get your information how do you access information mobile technologies is, is number one on the list right so if we're not thinking about delivering insight in that way then we miss that opportunity okay why is the actionable part of this so important why is actionability of information in digital agriculture, uh, why, why should that be a major thrust for us? Drives adoption. Drives adoption, right? How many, uh, those of you that do research, right? Um, think, about, uh, think about if your research lab only got to plan and execute a single experiment a year. That's all you had. You got one shot a year to run an experiment, okay? Think about what it could do for your lab if all of a sudden maybe you could correct something that was going wrong and get a second year of information out of that season, or out of that year. That's what, that's what actionability is. And for agriculture, we don't have that opportunity, right? A typical, you know, if you look at a 40-year career of a, of a corn soybean producer in Indiana, that means that producer gets 20 chances to grow a corn crop in a field, 20 experiments to get it perfect, okay? Think about that. Think about that in terms of how we think about replications, experimentation, and, and driving technology. So the actionability of the information, the ability to effectively sort of create a, a mulligan, right? Get a, get a redo in that season, take a step forward, um, allows us to uh, effectively get maybe 50 years of farming knowledge packed into a 40-year career. It allows us to progress more quickly into, uh, uh, into, into new technologies, management practices, or or in some cases, simply ward off uh, potential, uh, uh, potential uh, real challenges. 
Digital agriculture is accelerating this, uh, this process by infusing more data in customers' hands. So this, is, uh, this graph here, um, which may scare some of you in the room, is, is, uh, is uh, from a, a company called Farm Bus Farmers Business Network, right? Guess who owns them? Or who's a major investor? Google. Okay, so Google is very involved in agriculture at this point for, for many reasons. So this is, a, uh, this is a response of seeding rate for one variety across 320,000 acres within, within, this, uh, within this network, okay? Now, um, Purdue, Iowa State, Illinois, we all do these kind of trials in our research, we deliver this through extension. Uh, is Purdue planning 300,000 acres of single varieties to do yield response trials? No. So the power of having this much information, right, offers a lot of opportunities for where we can grow with this and where, where this technology can go. Are there risks associated with that? So, so I'm showing you a lot of data that, that, that uh, doesn't belong to me, but some producer you know, released into this network, into the system for, uh, for the purposes of this, of this growing and sharing and data analytics. So this does bring along a lot of questions about security and privacy and, and things that uh, are certainly major research questions across, to, across the university, for, across the, the nation for us to, uh, uh, to grapple with. Reducing the environmental footprint of agriculture. This is one that I think gets overlooked often in terms of the, uh, the viability of digital ag and what it can mean for uh, water quality and environmental stewardship. Okay? Is water quality important in, in Indiana? It's, it's important everywhere, right? <laughs> this is an issue. This is a major issue that we have to grapple with in agriculture. Right? If we, uh, applying data to these scenarios, applying uh, decision structures, whether it through like uh, soil erosion modeling or, or terrain analysis or nutrient pathways, the digitalization of agriculture, not only to provide the information, the knowledge on how to make the decisions with the delivery mechanism to execute is, is key. This, is a, this, this, this picture here um, is a variable rate tillage field. So all these highly erodible areas we didn't till. Right? So it's, it's an automated process now. We can, we can begin to control and change some of those mechanisms that maybe, uh, maybe years ago were, were more challenging to, uh, to cover. And then uh, the last thing here, digital ag, is, is automating these complex agricultural systems. And there's a, a number of examples of this. UAVs tend to be one of the, the main examples. This is a, a quick little animation of a, uh, of a scouting activity within a uh, production cornfield. So um, to actually go out and manually scout that field, would be a couple hour process, okay? With a UAV, we can fly it in about 30 minutes um, at a, with, a, with a person that's a much lower cost than is probably going to go out and do the initial scouting and use that for some virtual analysis to get information in specialist hands at the, uh, frankly, at the same level of resolution and detail and, and often greater detail than we would get from a, uh, uh, from a, from a traditional scouting operation. In addition to some of these activities, you know, machine learning, data science, you know, holistically is getting embedded into uh, uh, the majority of our, of our ag machines purely to make them smarter, okay? Uh, in agriculture, we really, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have in automation is around dealing with the environment. So weather changes, uh, crop condition shifts, uh, soil moisture, all that kind of stuff. And machine learning is a real key area that's, uh, uh, starting to open up those opportunities for us and, and making us ask ourselves for our undergraduate students you know where, where's the line of sort of the uh, the minimum amount of data science that they really need to, to understand to be uh, to be a professional engineer right to, uh, it's, it's no longer I think a field that is unique to itself as much as a complementary aspect or complementary uh, uh, part of, of all engineering and all, all sciences Okay, um, so to put this in a, in a succinct way, and again, there's, there's no wrong answer here because nobody can define digital agriculture, right? So to me, what, dig, what digital agriculture means to me is data science in action, right? To improve the economic, environmental, societal, and sustainability of agriculture, okay? We did a survey at, at Iowa State about a year ago when uh, we started to get big into digital agriculture to figure out who's working in digital agriculture in our College of Ag and Life Sciences. Guess what we figured out? If you think about the term agriculture and digital, that means data and agriculture, pretty soon it figured out that it was much easier to put a list together of who's not using digital anything in their research, right? This is a very, very wide spectrum, okay? So um, holistically though, 
right? The integration piece of data science really indicates that we're leveraging uh, the latest advances in, in technology, data mining, real-time data access, information flows, to turn that into the actionable information that leads to the improvement, right? The actionable information that we can take and, and, uh, and progress forward. So I wanna, I wanna share a few examples of, of, uh, of some, some things my team has done in this area and, and really talk about why we believe now is the right time to, uh, to grow these programs. And, and uh, I think Purdue would agree with this, uh, given where you're going with digital ag programs. So digital ag is naturally interdisciplinary, right? That in of itself makes it a phenomenal opportunity for universities to work in. We, we universities, have a unique advantage to be more interdisciplinary and tap into more expertise areas than any of the companies that we might work with. This is, I think this is in our wheelhouse. These complex issues of bringing together, particularly mixing biological, environmental, physical system modeling and bringing those into decision structures, that is, I think, inherently a university-grounded, university-led effort. Um, it's going to be empowered and certainly we'll, we'll leverage cloud computing, uh, data science and those innovations. Um, the, the third bullet's really important for us in the room, right? In today's market, the federal funding opportunities for digital agriculture are pretty broad, okay? Um, in my discipline of ag engineering and, and, and sort of the machinery automation side, 10 years ago, if you tried to get a federal grant to automate combine technologies, uh, you were out of luck. Those didn't exist. Okay? We have an environment today where both USDA and, S and NSF are putting funds into digital agriculture. Right? It's been a long time since we've had this much sort of opportunity from these, these federal programs to really have an impact. Right? So for our young faculty that are getting started, for our, for our, uh, uh, even for our established programs, this is an excellent opportunity to, to grow and, 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 and again, the time is right for this. Um, fourth point, the employees are expecting it. Right? Are, you, are your employers asking for more data competency in your students? Ours are. Right? So <laughs> digital ag is, is a great way to start to bleed those into, uh, into those programs. And then in the, uh, in the ag market today, any, any advance is good. So when you see the, uh, uh, the tight margins that, that exist in agriculture today, that has uh, continued to push um, companies to deliver solutions and universities to deliver solutions, knowledge-based solutions that help increase efficiency. Right? So on-farm profitability is driven by revenue and cost. So in times where prices of commodities are low, uh, you know your revenue is going to come down, you, you've got to maintain your profitability, your sustainability through, uh, uh, through working better with those, with those tight margins. As far as the direct value back, there are, uh, I could spend all day just talking about uh, just this one slide, but um, I think we all recognize the, uh, the graph on the right. That's not from me. Many of us have probably seen that in the room before, but uh, federal funding on basic research is, for the last 10 years, has been flat and in many areas has been declining, okay? Has Purdue, is, does Purdue have more faculty than it had 10 years ago? About the same? Okay. So this, this pool is not getting any larger. So we're all competing for that same pool, right? And so with our growth opportunities, this is, just makes it tighter and tighter. Look at the curve for, for corporate spending. On, this is on basic R&D. Okay, what have they done in the last 10 years? More than doubled, okay? Now, there is a, you know, pharmaceuticals is a large part of this. This isn't all just agriculture, of course. But it provides an indication that if we're really looking at, uh, at opportunities to drive programs, and we're just looking at, at federal funding opportunities to, 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 to create those innovations, we're probably missing a big opportunity. And uh, um, you know, finding your niche with industry is, uh, is really the key there to, to establish those, those relationships. Um, the other thing I'll note is that um, strong industry partnerships really can be very sustainable, very consistent. I think this is a, a, a myth about industry funding that it's not reliable. If you get a federal grant, you're gonna get three years of funding support, right? But do you know the next federal grant's gonna come? Or maybe there'll be a shutdown during that time and there'll be gaps. Does anybody have, you know, I assume Iowa State's on the only one that has funding gaps between federal projects. So with industry relationships, I think, uh, I think those that have been successful in this field have really found that these can be extremely 
consistent in supporting long-term research, right? And, and it's, the, it's really the relationship there and the quality of the relationship that, uh, that drives that. Um, the excellent educational programs is also huge here. The, um, um, I, I personally feel the, the, the way we work with industry helps to ensure that we do a better job in the classroom. We get, I think, more direct feedback into our curriculum. We have a little bit of a chance to see insights on what's coming down the way in a way that we can adapt and develop curriculum to, to uh, prepare students for, for where they need to go. So in addition to funding, What's, what other valuable resources do we need to do research? If you're going to accelerate a research, if I ask faculty, what, what, are the, what are the keys you need for a research program? Money is always the first one, right? So let's take that off the table. After that, what do we need? What do we need to be successful? People. Places where you can test things. Data. Is data helpful? This was, as a young faculty, this was something that, that shocked me. As I started my program at Iowa State, and uh, we started with some federal, uh, federal projects to get us started, and uh, I found myself on those projects spending 75% of the time and money developing test stands, instrumentation, collecting data, right? We spent all this time collecting data, and then we have this limited amount of time we actually focus on analytics and innovation and applications of that data. And uh, one of the things that's really uh, turned us on to industry partnerships is the ability to really leverage those partnerships for data, right? Because mo our industry partners usually already have that information, are looking for higher grade analytical skills. And uh, it has shifted our mindset of how we uh, run our operation to be more, more data focused and data centric and maybe eliminate some of these other, uh, 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 other activities that we used to do. So I'm going to give you a couple examples that we've been involved with. The first one is around cyber physical systems. Right? Cyber physical systems is a new buzzword. Um, we used to call it telematics. That came out of mechatronics. So the term is not necessarily new. The idea, but, but it's, it's, uh, this is an NSF term, so it's, it's kind of got an appeal to it now. Cyber physical systems simply mean that uh, we're going to connect things together. Right? This is the, uh, the uh, 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 um, Internet of Things type approach. So in Iowa, in 2010, we started to become a focal point of cellulosic biofuels. So cellulosic biofuels means taking these uh, bales of corn stover and uh, turning those into liquid fuel. Okay? So as a side question, uh, the 10 bales on the back of that wagon right there, how far do you think we can drive on those? If we turn those into ethanol and put them in your car, how far can you go? 50 miles? There's a prize for them. No, there's no prize for this. <laughs> 10,000 10, miles from just just the just the bales. You know, this this stack had, would be would be hundreds of thousands of miles. Just just the bales right there. 10,000 miles worth of ethanol. Now that's in a fuel efficient vehicle. That's not in a in a one ton pickup, right? Let's get that straight. <laughs> but. Uh, um, so we had a huge opportunity. I was becoming the focal point of this, and uh, this was going. This had to go from not being an industry at all to being a fully efficient, cost-effective supply chain that competes on cost with the petroleum industry in a matter of about eight years. So how do you do that without having a heavy focus on data, uh, information modeling to, to drive out some of those scenarios? And so uh, ourself and the, and the two, uh, DuPont and Poet, are both the companies in Iowa who have been developing these technologies. Um, we, we went at this from a perspective of applying cyber physical systems to achieve uh, optimization. And uh, in agriculture, we're lucky. We have a lot of data. This is a, a kind of a standard graphic of what a, a typical tractor would look like. And tractors have CAN buses on them, which are effectively the, the ethernet of, uh, of the ag vehicle. And everything you want to know about that machine is on the CAN bus, right? So we started a multi-year investment first in just the, uh, the basic acquisition of that data. That's the data origination piece. Get the data into a format you can use and then start to leverage it. We, uh, we were able to leverage that with virtual engineering, discrete element type modeling and, and, and system modeling to really bring in the weather piece of it. Because in eight years, when you have large weather sw swings in agriculture, you can't just test and wait for a wet year, wait for a dry year. So we need a lot of virtual engineering to... Uh, uh, to do that. We, uh, we also learned a term called infotainment. You know what infotainment means? I didn't either until. 
So one of the things that shocked us is from this data, no matter how much we trained the supply chain operators, who had zero, most of them had zero experience here, no matter how much we trained them, we weren't seeing change. And if you're a controls engineer, you should be able to affect change and control the system. But when you still have a human in the seat, we had to think differently about how we were delivering digital information and technologies to truly drive change. One of the simplest things was uh, is relating to how many bales per day of corn stover we produced. So a baler should make 400 bales per day. It's pretty simple math. There's so many per hour it makes, and you got so many hours a day, and it, that should work, right? And no matter how much we pound in that, we were basically, uh, usually we were on the order of uh, uh, 30 to 40 percent under what the uh, supply chain should be able to achieve, okay? And that really was driven by the fact that folks would go out in the morning, they would check the fields, they say, ah, it's not quite ready to go, I'm gonna wait another hour, and then, you know. And uh, so what we did is we turned it into a game. We tapped into the, we used data to tap into the innate sort of uh, competitiveness of uh, operators. So these dots up here are all the balers running in the supply chain. This is a real-time information. So we, we, we threw a telematics module on there, we ran it through a server, right? You do some quick analytics, and then you, you put stuff on a website. This is, it's not, not rocket science, it's the application of the science and technology to do this, right? So the dots, the red versus green, if it's moving or not, and the, the number in the middle is uh, how many bales they've made that day, okay? All of a sudden, right, this is like posting name and, and grade on the wall, right? <laughs> In, in the matter of a single, I mean, literally, the week after we released this, productivity jumped 35%, okay? Purely by getting the right simple information, right? This is where we have to sometimes, um, you know, <laughs> the, the analytics report behind this is like 100 pages, right? Well, that's not, nobody's going to read that. So you got to figure out how to, how to tap into the human aspect of this through data delivery to affect change, right? Remember the comment I made earlier about Having, it's, it's not just about knowledge development, it's about affecting change, the ability that we have to, uh, to correct and, and, uh, and reinforce the system. The other thing we're able to do is implement prognostics. What's prognostics? Prognostics is predicting failures, right? So we were able to get to the point where we, were, we could send a service team to a machine before the machine broke, okay? And through that, we reduced um, cost of, 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 of maintenance but also increase productivity substantially from that, just through data streams, right? Just as the, the classic leverage data that's available, set up infrastructure and, and, and make decisions uh, from that, okay? The uh, economic impact of this, uh, we took 40% directly, 40% of the cost out of the, uh, out of the supply chain. And the best story I'll tell here is um, there was, uh, in this picture, there, there's about 10 different crews or, or, or businesses, these are small businesses, these are farmer-owned businesses, and uh, about seven of them were local Iowa businesses, Three of them had come from across the country that were really technical experts in the area. And the one that had the longest experience in this wanted nothing to do with this. They didn't need it. They had experience. We could take a fresh Iowa group of uh, mo mostly Iowa State college students and, and a few farmers, and within a week they could outpace a company with 30 years of experience just by using data. Right? And that's, that's the kind of change that we're talking about in the information flows. Other areas, uh, sensor fusion. We use sensor fusion in a lot of projects to uh, in machine learning to help make ag machines smarter. So grain yield monitoring. Grain yield monitoring has been around a long time. This is a yield map, so red is, red is high yield, uh, sorry, red is uh, low yield, green is high yield. This technology has been around for 25 years. So I see an ag leader hat in the back. Ag leader was the company that invented precision agriculture and, and launched, the, uh, launched the whole industry, right? Yield monitors, though, are designed mostly for large grains in the Midwest, and they have some real challenges when they get out globally. And uh, if anybody's worked with yield data, you probably know that it doesn't always look pretty, right? Sometimes it's, uh, it can be challenging. The uh, yield monitors themselves utilize a uh, sensing technology that, that basically resolves the uh, impact force from grain and uh, turns that into uh, a, uh, uh, through a strain gauge, turns it into something we can measure, and then we relate that to mass flow. The problem is if crop moisture changes or the coefficient of uh, restitution of the grain changes or density changes, it doesn't work anymore. We lose calibration pretty fast. Okay? Through telematics data, um, we were able to assert that uh, the typical producer in the Midwest at best calibrated their combine once a year. Okay? So it just wasn't happening. But yet yield data 
is the fundamental piece of information we use for every optimization project. So if yield data isn't right, this whole thing doesn't work. And that's the Midwest. You get to Brazil, there's no infrastructure to even ground truth against. Same thing with much of Europe or Ukraine. Big issues globally. So we, took, uh, we had some innovation around how to solve this through data fusion. So this, uh, this involves, we put a couple, uh, couple sensors in a grain tank and uh, used other data streams from within the machine, uh, as well as use some physical or some uh, uh, kind of a uh, discrete element model analysis of how grain piles and, and flows into a combine. And as part of that, we were able to create an innovation of data fusion that every single time we fill the combine with grain, we produce on machine automatically a calibration load for the combine. So effectively, as the, as the producer drives, they, the combine gets calibrated, right? It just keeps self-calibrating. Um, and if you think about a regression curve, in statistics, we're always worried on the end of the regression curve, if you're trying to fit a curve through a couple data points, the accuracy of a single point, right? Data science, central limit theorem, says if we just throw a ton of calibration points at it, we don't have to be perfect with every calibration point. We just have to be perfect on the average of all the calibration points. Right? And that's, that's the philosophy uh, behind this. So this, uh, this got released. Um, uh, we, we licensed this to John Deere. And uh, they released it as part of, a, of an active yield uh, program. And, and this is what it looks like. A, a default calibration from the factory can be huge swings in accuracy. The novice, this is what a typical producer can achieve at once a year. Our active yield system is as good as an expert calibrating every single field that they, that they go into. We can't beat that. We can't beat an actual ground truth if you do it in every single field. But we also know nobody does that. 2% of people do that. And even more important here is the fact that this, uh, this technology has opened up yield data accuracy in parts of the world that simply don't have the infrastructure to do this. And that's the thing that I think really gets us excited about uh, you know, folks in Brazil and in the Ukraine and in parts of Europe that now have, have, uh, have, have better data. It has, uh, it has also created some unique opportunities to get feedback. So um, we all get interesting comments sometimes with uh, student evaluations or maybe uh, peer-reviewed journals. And, one of the things about licensing technology is pretty soon people start tweeting about the stuff that you was a PhD project, right? And uh, uh, of course, I cherry pick the ones that are really positive, but and most of them, <laughs> most of them are. But you know, this is for us. This is really fun, right? This is you know, John Deere liking active yield data science on the go, right? That's impact. That's a PhD project that now is creating better data for agriculture, right? That's. That's the value of commercialization, I think, when we, we really scale this up and, and, uh, uh, and, and create uh, uh, huge opportunities. And then, you know, we've, we've been able to, uh, you know, of course, Christian doesn't know that we were involved, and that's okay, right? We have other ways to recognize our innovations through other award metrics and, and things to, to make sure that we, uh, uh, we can evaluate those at the university. The last one is the use of uh, supervised machine learning and pattern recognition. So to me, uh, pattern recognition and supervised machine learning is again one of these areas that uh, there's still a lot of uh, research going on, but for an ag engineer, this is a tool in the toolbox, right? This is just one more thing we can, we can use. Uh, in agriculture, we have, we, have, we have used ultrasonic sensors and load cells and pressure sensors to every potential opportunity. And so vision systems are the next frontier of what, uh, of what we're doing in, in agriculture. We've been partnering with uh, uh, both Deere as well as uh, Carnegie Mellon, the National Robotics Engineering Center at Carnegie Mellon in this space. Um, for uh, for op automation of agriculture, in the automotive sector, automation means taking the driver out of the loop. For us to do that, it's easy to steer, we already steer the vehicle, right? For us, it's about automating the functions. And so we started with, uh, with automating combine, combine uh, threshing systems and used machine learning and trained images to be able to predict differences in broken content, differences in foreign matter, and then use that to close the loop on, on combine control and operation, right? So automating key aspects of the, uh, of the supply chain. The other area that, uh, that we've been able to, to really leverage this is in the, uh, the sugarcane industry. Sugarcane is the, is the highest producing crop in the world, okay? So there's more tonnage of sugarcane produced than any other crop in the world. Most of it's in Brazil, some of it's in the southern U.S. as well. Sugarcane has a long history of having, uh, uh, not having a sustainable yield monitor product, right? not having a really high quality yield monitor solution. 
Um, this is a picture of you ever seen a cane harvester. It's, it's kind of a science experiment on steroids. And uh, they go through and they cut the cane. It gets chopped up in little billets and then, then goes out the, uh, the back of the machine. Uh, we had a chance through some, uh, again, some, some machine learning and stereo vision type technologies to use stereo vision to measure total flow rates of material through the, uh, through the cane elevator and, uh, and turn this into a, a licensed commercial product. So uh, Deere currently sells this as the, uh, it's the only commercially available sugarcane yield monitor on the, uh, in the world. In my career, as far as highlights of things that we've done, the, uh, about two years ago when we were um, you know, com you know, sharing some of this information with folks, and particularly in Brazil, where the sugarcane industry is has a lot of work to do logistically, but is actually a fairly data-driven process. And the opportunity to really uh, show them the potential this has for their industries and, and get the feedback that they're seeing was just, just huge. In addition to yield, um, you know, the neat thing about cameras is you can do a lot with them. So sometimes you see there's more trash and loose stuff in here than other times. So we actually measure trash content as well and then can, uh, can close the loop and, and, uh, uh, and control the, uh, you know, the, the cleaning system to do a full system automation. All right, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's digital ag. So a um, couple comments here on, on uh, I guess, my, my view on industry partnerships and, and things that we need to do to, to establish good industry partnerships, then I'm going to open this up for, uh, for questions. Uh, first of all, from a university level, and I actually break this apart and say there's things at the university level we should do, things at the, sort of the faculty level. At the university level, we need to be intentional about what we want. If we want faculty to work with industry, create commercialized partnerships, we need to ask for it. That line at the bottom is one that uh, is starting to pop up more and more in job descriptions. Successful candidates expect to develop high impact research program with specific emphasis on technology transfer and industry engagement. If we, if we want it, if it's important to us, we need to verbalize that. We need to, we need to communicate. That's a goal that we have. Okay? Um, the P&T process is also extremely, extremely important. This is, uh, um, this is, this is my publication history. Right? So I started in 2008 at Iowa State. I had a very traditional pathway of federal grants and, uh, and uh, peer-reviewed journal publications. I got tenure in, in 2012 over here, so most of these are journals. We made an intentional shift in that year to say, we are going to really start focusing on tech transfer. That's, that's what we want to do. And so at Iowa State, we've been very proactive about saying, when we look at peer-reviewed publications, it's all of these together. There isn't, we're not going to do you know, journals on one and then, and then go over and say, here's a little table of tech transfer we do, right? What's, what's the definition of peer review? Independent assessment of quality of scholarship, right? Many of us have reviewed papers. Sometimes we spend a lot of time on it. Sometimes, maybe not so much. Think about the, the process when we license technology, right? Think about the, 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 it's the same thing, right? You've got industry experts who are reviewing your technology in detail and then writing a check for it. Does that have the same level of scrutiny for scholarship? We think so. And so we've been really pragmatic about making sure we say this is a goal for us and we're, gonna, uh, and we're going to, uh, to use that. The last bullet's also really important, providing shared services for basic data needs. I have found, the, uh, particularly in some of the uh, agronomic sciences areas, the, the collaborators I work with, they have excellent ideas, don't know anything about IT at all. I mean, they really don't have a, a functional background, right? So within our team, we've actually started to provide basic data services to those other sciences. So you know, we help them set up databases. We help them set up information transfer. We help them set up cloud computing, right? Because a little bit of that basic support is able to amplify what they do, right? Take, take innovations and just blow it up from there. And uh, I think that's something that, uh, you know, universities need to be, uh, well, if you want to grow in this area, it's one of those basic uh, sort of shared services that's necessary to really uh, develop uh, critical partnerships. And then at the faculty level, there's a, there's a similar level of sort of uh, uh, needs. First and foremost is you've got to build the right team. And uh, I think deep industry connections usually, many times, will require a little different mix of who you hire, right? It's difficult to maintain long-term, highly engaged industry partnerships that, that cover multiple years with just graduate students. Because we love graduate students. They do excellent work. And then what happens? They leave. They graduate. 
So continuity through programs is, uh, is forced us, and in fact, uh, that's why we have uh, several uh, um, uh, research faculty on our staff who really lead programs, right? They're, they're, they're really excellent, excellent individuals. Uh, promoting that culture of entrepreneurship, right? Making sure that uh, the folks that work for us understand the same vision and mission of the impact of, of, uh, of collaboration is, is key. Acknowledging and overcoming ceilings that exist within the university system. So maybe Purdue doesn't have any of these, but there are, uh, <coughs> Oftentimes, as we, as faculty, take on more and more opportunities, um, there, there isn't necessarily the, uh, uh, sometimes it doesn't make work easier, right? Sometimes that, that just makes, makes more work to get done maybe the same amount of, of effort. And so uh, uh, we think that if you're really going to create these relationships that have such a touch point back to educational programs and, and other benefits the university, making sure that you don't, uh, that you protect yourself there and make sure you've got that top end uh, capability to, uh, 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 to be productive and engaged is really key. Uh, communication is huge. I, I, at this point, we will not do a project with an industry sponsor unless they commit to a one-hour conference call every other week. If it's not important enough to them to put somebody on the project to talk to us and, and stay in connection, then we, we, don't, we won't do it. Right? Communication is key in these. And that, in my opinion, is what translates from a sort of one-off industry project into a really strong strategic relationship. That's a, that's a key difference. So we've got about 10 minutes here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and wrap up. I'm going to leave you with this. This is a statement I, I tell our students quite a bit. I said, the value of the innovation is measured by the impact of the answer, not the complexity of the solution. I think that totally encapsulates digital agriculture. There are a lot of low-hanging fruit, frankly, in digital agriculture where just a little bit of the right information in the right hands can have a huge impact, right? And so sometimes we tend to, maybe, maybe, we, maybe the academics in us, we, we want to take things to the nth degree of analysis or, or, or technology we're bringing to bear, and we've always got to come back to what's the real innovation, what's the impact, how are we using this to redirect and, uh, uh, and really move the needle within, uh, within production agriculture. So with that, uh, willing to take uh, uh, qu any questions that you have. I'm going to go ahead and use the microphone in case everybody can hear and we're recording. I don't even know. Um, so I'm curious about this notion of having the university and or your college make a commitment to having tech transfer and commercial and industry relationships be critical. Did you, you know, when you started talking about, you know, how patents became important and the P and T process, did you, were you engaged in the discussions to have that be like a, was it like a switch in the in, in the way you worked on things, or were you just lucky enough to be in a position when the university or the department was thinking about making that kind of a transfer? Because I yeah. think it's a very important distinction. That's a great, that's a very, very great question. So um, our faculty handbook has had tech transfer scholarship, right, and, and the arts and sciences certainly as well. It's not, a lot of that's not, scholarship is not done through traditional peer-reviewed articles. Um, so it's always been there as language. Um, our provost actually is, is pretty uh, progressive in this space. Our provost, Jonathan Wickert, was uh, uh, co-authored a, uh, um, a document from a, kind of an AAU group on how to, how to enhance the visibility of, uh, of tech transfer. So I had, we had that working for us, that we had a very senior person within the university administration saying, this is important. And uh, um, I think every university sort of has a culture, right? I mean, there, I mean, we all have things that we know we really, really exceed at. And at Iowa State, we believe this is a cultural element of what we do. And so um, I will say not every department has that same vision. But certainly within the College of, of Agriculture and Life Sciences and through the majority of the College of Engineering, uh, it's, it's uh, widely accepted now that peer-reviewed tech transfer is the same level as journal articles. Now, I'm, I'm careful there to say that. That doesn't mean a patent disclosure is a peer-reviewed article, right? A patent disclosure is not peer-reviewed. But when it gets to a point where it is truly licensed, truly patented, has gone through a standardized process, then it's, it's an equal. Lots of communication, though, there. Yes? Uh, I just want to hear a little bit more about the team that you have, how you built it, and how many disciplines are involved. And 
Yeah. Uh, so in full disclosure, my wife is the Vice President of Human Resources for Iowa State University. So I know more about uh, personnel development and the HR system than any normal faculty should, right? Um, so how do we build the team, first and foremost? Um, first of all, we, um, I go through a strategic planning every, every year. We revise our internal strategic plan to make sure that we're, we're heading in the right direction. As we go through that, we pick in the next three-year cycle, what are the things we're really going to target, and do we have those right people on our team to do that? That has driven us to go outside of our own current bounds, right? Five years ago, I had half the size team, but it was all people that were kind of like me, right? And as we've looked at these strategic areas, we've said, no, we really need somebody in soils, right? Because soil machine interaction is a big deal for us. That's something we need. And we need a PhD uh, computer engineering person leading our data science machine learning efforts, right? Because that's really important. But, um, you know, I, I can't do that myself. So, um, and then you, then you take risk, right? Because we have a, we have a phenomenal amount of, of soft-funded staff on one-year contracts. So every faculty member has to decide where they want to be in that, in that uh, risk portfolio to make sure that you, you manage that. Um, in our case, we have, uh, so there's, there's, uh, there's like 15 kids in daycare that their parents work for me. So there's a responsibility there to make sure those jobs are, are stable and continual. Um, and then, you know, I think I have to have the philosophy as a leader of that team that I, I may be steering the ship, but, you know, there are, there are leaders underneath that are really driving programs. Um, and of those individuals, you have to be competitive with the package you provide them, and you have to give them opportunities to, to, for upward mobility. And uh, the upward mobility piece is, is one that, uh, you know, you, you can't look at them as being an assistant scientist at the university for, for 10 years, right? Those are, that may not be the type of person that you want. And so you've got to have a plan for how to let those individuals grow and, and really feel, feel like uh, we're checking all the boxes for them professionally. Yeah, John. So you showed a lot of uh, kind of slides with trends and a projection. So if I asked you to make a projection what the farm of the future is going to look like in, say, 10 years or 15 years, whatever you want to pick, how would, how would you describe what the impact of digital ag might be in that length of time? The, the farm of the future. Right, so um, I I believe so I, I believe a lot in technology growth. I will tell you I uh, I am not as bullish on full automation and and and, uh, and small scale robotics in production ag as maybe some some colleagues are. Um, as far as the, the trend and direction, if it if I was starting over today and start a new program, uh, machine learning is huge, right? And, and and there's a whole field of time series based machine learning that we could leverage tremendously in ag that has a lot of scientific questions uh, still, to, still to answer in that space. We generally, all of, our, all of our machine intelligence today is still mostly driven by linear regression models with a very few sets of variables, and yet we're generating gigs and gigs of data that we're just throwing away uh, on the machines. So that, that's a huge part. The second thing that I think is shifting agriculture, and will continue to shift on the, on the, on the farm technology side, is uh, we're quickly going to get to the place, I believe, where when that machine leaves the factory, that software that's on it is no longer the software that just stays on it, right? Today, um, if you have a machine that in one part of your field doesn't act right, every time you drive through that field, it doesn't act right there every time, right? Because it's the same control system, it's the same software happening over and over. With cloud connectivity, we have a chance to start learning between machines. We have a chance to start adapting machine technologies regionally. Okay? If you sell tractors into 10 countries and multiple continents, you're going to shoot for the middle in terms of per performance specs in order to make sure all your customers have a, a, a realistic you know, set of, of, of uh, expectations. The ability with cloud computing to really automate that and begin to, to self-tune to environments, which is a totally different way to do software development on machines, I think is going to unlock a, another tremendous set of uh, uh, tools for us in optimization. So 10 years. There's still going to be people in, in, in tractors and combines. Um, they are, but, but the level of augmentation through um, control systems is going to, I think we're on an escalating curve there. Yes, sir.
Oh, that's a great question. I think the industries we work with, um, they really they do struggle with the nebulous that, that exists within universities and understanding how to get to the right person is a, is a real key. Um, I'm sure not we're the only ones that, I mean, sometimes a contact will come in through an industry relationship somewhere, and you guys probably don't forward emails to this university, do you? <laughs> but sometimes you get an email that's forwarded like for, from, a, from an industry relations to a research park out to colleges, out to department chairs, out to faculty, right? And, and there's no follow, I don't, I don't speak to how Purdue does things, but there's not always a good follow through there. That is, uh, I think we have a tremendous amount more we could provide if we could connect the dots. The other piece is uh, you have to be committed, there, there has to be a mutual benefit. You have to be committed to understanding what the company expects, right? And um, uh, I think, particularly with younger, I met a lot of younger faculty, and I think in, uh, Younger faculty today, the PhDs that come out, they're not all necessarily set on going to academia. There's a lot more job opportunities for PhDs in industry than there were maybe 30 years ago, at least in the fields I work in. And so they tend, I think, to have a more entrepreneurial spirit right, to them. And, uh, um, and that's a culture that I, I think universities should try to really maximize in the next couple decades. Yes, sir. Do you see a role for open source in digital ag? That's a that's a great. I mean, that's a whole that's a whole multiple. That's a I don't know how to answer that in a couple minutes. Um, it's tricky, right? I mean, you talk about um, open source from a like from a pure software perspective. I mean, you're talking about like uh, like control of machine software and, and serviceability and those sort of things. There there are there are safety implications that come in that are that are real, right? That you have to you have to manage through. Um, on the data side, you know, I, there, you can sit on either side of the fence in here, right? So you can, you know, there's, there's reasons that we need to make sure data privacy, we have good standards in for data privacy. Um, at the same time, we also need data mobility. We have to be able to move data around between places. And, and I think to me, whether it's through uh, uh, true open source solutions or whether it's through sort of industry guided solutions, as long as the farmer is in the seat, as long as they're the ones that get to make the decision on where data goes and who accesses it, and it's it's under their control. I'm I'm good with however that's that's implemented. Yes, sir. Related to that, how much of your intellectual property is licensed exclusively versus non-exclusive? That's an easy question. All of it is exclusively licensed. So we have uh, Iowa State has a flexible solutions, very similar in parallel to the flexible solutions that Purdue has. So I think your flex. Number three, I think, is the, uh, is the uh, upfront fee uh, that, that, that buys uh, uh, royalty-free exclusive licensing. And uh, we, we use that. We're the half of that. We use base, uh, half of those contracts Iowa State that use that. We're 50% we're of all those contracts. So uh, we're, we're heavily invested in that. Our industry partners have loved that. It has taken out any back-end negotiation it allows them to budget the cost or understand the cost structure up front. Uh, so when they get ready to commercialize, they're not trying to figure out how to set the price because they don't know what Iowa State's going to charge for intellectual property. So uh, that, I think, has been, I think universities that don't offer that, and Purdue does, are, are going to be behind in the next, uh, next 10 years because it's, it's, an, it's too broad of an option now at, at institutions. Yes, sir. Are you working at all with blockchain or any plans for uh, incorporating that? Yeah, um, we certainly certainly aware of it, and uh, uh, that's that's about it. We're not doing anything. We're not actively engaged right now. Yep. Yeah, Lisa. Hey, Matt. So you mentioned about soils being important, and in doing, you know research managed fields, it seems as though we still don't have a good solid understanding of what's going on there. Yeah. From a soil lab perspective, we have yeah. some machines coming, et cetera. Is there anything that you're learning or working on that's going to improve our understanding of the soil? Yeah, that's tough, right? I get, I get a kick out of uh, you know, a lot of UAV high, high resolution stuff we can do with plants, like, oh, there's a problem with that variety. It's like, no, it's a soil thing, right? The, it's not a variety thing. Um, we, we, we have some, uh, we, we do some R&D in that space. Um, Physics, you can't fight, you can't, you can't cheat physics, right? And physics just says measuring things with, with what our understanding of 
physics is today, measuring things below the sole surface with any level of accuracy, even, even in the near surface area, is just tough. And uh, I wish I was more optimistic about breakthroughs there. Um, I think we're going to be, I, I think we may get, it may be a, the more productive solution is going to be through modeling, through better understanding of, of weather events and tire traffic and soil dynamics to give us some indications because direct measurements of, uh, we've been trying to measure compaction for decades, right? And we're not, we're not getting any closer. Just to follow on to that is um, one of the things that's happening currently is, you know, environmental defense fund, nature conservancy, soil health initiative, et cetera, they're wanting to create a soil health benchmark starting in the Corn Belt, right? Yep. And they want farmers to get compensated or monetized for maintaining it. But, how, you know, tools to do that, they want to identify cover crops, so that's machine learning with imagery, yep. right? They want yep. to identify tillage practice, so again, but fundamentally, our soil tests, you send to four different labs, you get six different answers. Yeah. So, so Agreed. So nothing there, though, in the soil lab side? No. No, it's, that's, uh, it's soils are tough. Yeah. Okay, thank you so yeah. much. So Matt, I know you could answer questions all day, but maybe one final one. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what do you see as the role of startups in the whole innovation entrepreneurship process? That's a great. That's a great question. That's a very good question. So, in some ways, we compete against startups, right? We could we could spin businesses off and do this. We choose to do it with inside the university environment. I think there's, I think there's real role for both, right? I think uh, um, so. In the way industry look at how industry is investing in research, right? Industry isn't all that. Uh, industry still does their own internal research but they're also leveraging venture capital to sort out the winners and losers, right? So it's kind of a unique environment where you might overpay to buy a company but you, for that one company, but you've saved yourself a whole lot of money in R&D by you know, trying 100 different things to get to that one company that, that survived. Um, in the ag sector, I think that's only gonna continue to grow. I think you're gonna continue to see a lot of opportunities for smart startups, in this dig, particularly in this digital ag space, that are going to be highly desired by uh, some of the more majors to add into their uh, their portfolio. Uh, 